Uh, hopefully this works better. Day where they sleep half his body of work is largely filled with images. Yes, that's good. Yes, you're right. Most recent it. is titled A Thousand Mornings. I spoke with her from member station WSHU in Fairfield, Connecticut. She began our interview by reading her poem, I Happen to Be Standing. I don't know where prayers go or what they do. Do cats pray while they sleep half asleep in the sun? Does the opossum pray as it crosses the street? The sunflowers, the old black oak growing older every year. I know I can walk through the world along the shore or under the trees with my mind filled with things of little importance in full self-attendance, a condition I can't really call being alive. Is a prayer a gift or a petition or does it matter? The sunflowers blaze, maybe that's their way. Maybe the cats are sound asleep, maybe not. While I was thinking this, I happened to be standing just outside my door with my notebook open, which is the way I begin every morning. Then a wren in the privet began to sing. He was positively drenched in enthusiasm. I don't know why. And yet, why not? I wouldn't persuade you from whatever you believe or whatever you don't. That's your business. But I thought of the wren singing, what could this be if it isn't a prayer? So I just listened, my pen in the air. Poet Mary Oliver, I asked her if she in fact begins her days the way she describes in this poem, I happen to be standing. Uh, almost. I thought, gee, I do lie a little bit. And I should have said, <laughs> which is the way I begin most mornings. <laughs> uh, talk to me a little bit about that ritual. Do you make it part of a writing discipline to go out into the world and make some observations every day? I think it began with discipline because I, I did understand that any artistic venture requires a lot of discipline. But it's no longer a, a discipline. It's no longer something I think about. I just, uh, I, I'm often up, to, oh, most mornings I'm up to see the sun. And that rising of the light moves me very much. And uh, I'm used to uh, thinking and feeling in words. So it, it, it sort of just happens. Have you always done that? Have you always yes. written in the mornings? Yes, yes, I like the mornings. I like to give the mornings to those, those first good thoughts. And it, I suppose in a way it, it sets up the day. You have written many collections. How is this one different? I think one thing is that, is that prayer has become more useful, interesting, fruitful, and I get almost involuntary in my life. And when I talk about prayer, I mean uh, really what that uh, Rumi says in that wonderful line, there are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. I'm, I'm not theological specifically. I might uh, pick a flower for Shiva as, as well as uh, say the hundredth prayer. The, the name of the God doesn't interest me so much as the fact that there are so many uh, names of that mystery. Has your work become more prayerful, more spiritual over the years? I would say yes. Maybe a little bit of that is the, the two things I loved from a very early age were the natural world and dead poets, which were <laughs> my pals when I was a, a kid. But the concern I have for the natural world is um, really a, a very sorrowful business. Why sorrowful? Because we aren't doing what we should do to, to preserve the, the, the world. The woods that I loved as a child are entirely gone. The woods that I loved as, as a young adult are gone. The woods that, that most recently I walked in, are, they're not gone, but they're full of bicycle trails. And, and uh, I grew up in a town that was 3,500 people in, in Ohio, very pastoral, and where there, there were woods to go to. That town is now over 250,000 people. And this is happening to, to the world, and I think it is very, very dangerous for our future de generations, those of us who, who believe that the, the world is not only necessary to us in its pristine state, Father Dave, you lost the sound. There you go. I have to be beautiful to work, but it is. What does that mean? 
because you write about the natural world and because you write these these beautiful meditations about uh, about your natural surroundings, as so many others have done, mm-hmm. how do you find new words to describe what you see? I suppose by paying very close, close, close attention to things and seeing new details. Um, I love words. I love the mechanics of poetry. I often speak of the the choreography of the poem on the page, and the, to find a new word that is accurate and different is you have to be alert for it. It's wonderful. It's fun. But one thing I I do know is is that a, a poetry to to be understood must be clear. It mustn't it mustn't be fancy. I I, I have the feeling that a, that a lot of poets writing now are. They, they sort of tap dance through it. They, they, I always feel that whatever isn't necessary should not be in the poem. How do you know when a poem is done? Uh, well, I don't know that you, that you ever know, but, but in some way you have made a completion of, of a thought or a mood or whatever you're doing. And it, it's time to go on with, with the next one. Mary Oliver. Her new book of poetry is called A Thousand Mornings. She joined us from member station. So many good things in in that video, in that interview, uh, where she speaks of paying careful, careful, careful attention to the world, that that is at the very heart of the artistic project. You could say that it's all about appreciation and gratitude, mm-hmm. not taking anything or anyone for granted that it's all a gift. And in fact, that's one of the titles of, of a work that we'll be looking at tonight. So let's jump in. We, we've, we've talked about her and her, her work. Now let's actually read it together and learn from each other. So again, I'm going to share my screen with you um, so that you can see the, the works. Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, I'm wondering if a volunteer, please, would be willing yeah. to read from Matthew's Gospel words that you've heard before about worry and anxiety. Would anyone like to read that for us? This is the passage. I think Nancy Bouchard is going to read this. This is the passage, actually, that's used on Thanksgiving Day for the Thanksgiving service. So a little little hint of what is to come sooner than we think. Nancy. Okay. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Matthew 6. Thanks, Nancy. Mm I'm going to give you a second just to let that sink in. And then I want to jump in without any comment right into Mary's poem, which is called I Worried. So I'm just going to leave a little quiet time to let the scriptures settle in before we turn our attention to the poem. Okay, um, there's something about the image of Jesus turning our attention to the birds of the air. I think of Mary Oliver when she referenced wrens and the the song of the wren. And you'll hear her reference sparrows in this poem. And the natural world helps kind of give her a course correction here when 
she begins to spiral with anxiety and worry. Like, I'll just speak for myself. When I have one of these little episodes, sometimes getting out into the natural world can help reset us um, in the ways that sometimes an act of service to someone else, you know, calling a friend, writing a, a note, uh, dropping off a meal at someone's house can be kind of a reset for our soul and help establish perspective. So don't worry about getting this perfect, but is there a brave soul who would like to read Mary, Mary's poem, I Worried? And thanks, Kenneth. And I thought this would be wonderful for us during this time of COVID because I don't know about you, um, I'm doing my fair share of worrying. So I thought this might be good news for you tonight. <laughs> Kenneth, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, I worried. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it, and I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading, or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing, and I gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. I love this poem. I, and <laughs> My favorite is the word lockjaw because it's like, it's just like such an old, like, you know, I can, I can remember as a child, like if, oh my God, I'm going to get bit by a rabid dog and get lockjaw, you know, it's just like every, every kid's nightmare. Um, um, you know, it, it's just like, I don't know about you, but if you've ever gone onto WebMD and you start putting in symptoms, you're like, oh my God, I'm dying, I'm going to die. <laughs> It's like this spiral. Um, so what do you make of this poem? What's, what are, what's striking you on that first reading of it? I just, I'll just share my thoughts because um, I've read this poem before. And uh, I love this poem because it, it talks about, for me, even though we may worry about things, when we allow ourselves to be a part of the bigger expanse of nature and participate in it, then we realize our worrying, mm -hmm. we're bigger than our worrying. There's, we're a part of something bigger. That's, that's how I, that's what I get out of it. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Mm -hmm. Other observations on this poem what's shimmering out there on the horizon for you i like how she moves past herself that the great resolution of this was that she disregarded all the things that she was in control of or that she needed to do better on or that she was or might be ailing and she just moved past the whole world as herself and went out into the world and enjoyed it I, perfect. I and mean, Carol, what do you think helps her make that shift? What What is it that helps her to to get to a, a new perspective, a new place? Uh, just the worthlessness of worrying. She finally just said, ah, I'm giving this up. Um, and she went out into the sunshine and saw what a better alternative it was. You know what I love about this poem? It reflects something that she said, and, and I had... I hadn't thought about this in, in her interview about the plainness of the words. I mean, this, this poem, the imagery is so clear, but the words are very plain. There is no verbal prancing here. Um, <laughs> and it, it, she gets across a total feeling, um, a, a before and after feeling. Amen. Mm -hmm. How about the, the structure, the form of the poem? What do you notice? You know, where do we start? Where do we end up? What do you notice a lot of in the beginning and how she structures it? There are a 
lot of, excuse me, Father Dave, there are a lot of questions. I don't know much about poetry, but there, there are a lot of questions. Um, she's questioning herself. She's questioning what's going to happen um, to the nature around her. Um, she's questioning her health. Uh, it's, and then she finally gives up the questioning. And um, as Carol Newman said so well, she moves beyond that. She moves beyond all these questions and goes out to live and to be happy. And as, as Carol said also, Nancy, right, she moves from a place of I mm -hmm. to something that, and we talked before about the importance of the particularity of poems. Mm -hmm. So she names specific things. I love this. Will the garden grow? I mean, who hasn't planted something and said, you know, is that plant going to thrive or is that, is that you know, what's going to happen there? And then I love this, you know, as if humans, you know, unless we're the Army Corps of Engineers, will the rivers flow in the right direction? I mean, as if we had a say. <laughs> will the earth turn as it was taught? Um, you know, it's, she's taking on these massive burdens of existence. Um, Mary Ellen. Well, Father Dave, and that was curious to me, and I loved it where she starts, you know, will the garden grow? And then immediately, will the rivers flow in the right direction? So for me as a worrier, I'm like, oh my God, something else I have to worry about. And, <laughs> and that was before we even got to lockjaw. <laughs> um, but then it goes from the catastrophic, will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And further along, am I ever going to be able to sing? I, it's, it was just such a, um, such a distinction there from the catastrophic to the ordinary and back to, you know, something that she's thought about, I guess, and worried about. Am I ever going to be able to sing? And I know that could be at different levels, but in the very plain statement, it, it was almost, you know, made me smile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. And you know, she moves from, we might even say, the cosmic in the first stanza mm -hmm. um, down to the, you know, that, the second two lines, that couplet there, to the much more personal, you know, was I right? Was I wrong? Mm -hmm. Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? I mean, you know, and we all are haunted by those things, you know, gosh, did I say the right thing? Was I too harsh on so-and-so? Um, I'm thinking of a novel I read a while back, and it, it was a really funny novel by Jonathan Franzen, and I think it's called Freedom. And one of the characters, she's a middle-aged woman, um, writes her autobiography, which parts of it are located within the narrative of this novel. And the title of it at midlife was, <laughs> this is my favorite part, Mistakes were made. <laughs> and I think all of us come to that point in life where we look back and go, darn, mistakes were made. <laughs> you know? A lot of good stuff happened, but, you know, was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Um, and then, of course, moving to, am I going to be able to sing? Um, what else, what else do, you, do you all see in this? In this work, Father Dave, is is as if, if as though she moves from the realm of what ifs to why not? Ooh, I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a kind of stepping out in faith. I, I, I'm sorry. Was did someone else have a thought? Uh. This is Kathy, Father Dave. I, I think it's, it's, there's a lot of humor here. And as, as a confirmed worrier myself, um, you know, you, you see the silliness of, of what you're doing sometimes. And so I think she's, she's laughing at herself and helping us laugh at ourselves. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, humor's profound because humor is a way of resetting isn't it our perspective so she jettisons wearing and she goes out into the morning and just sings not wearing if 
if she's doing it right or if she's doing it wrong or if she's singing as beautifully as a sparrow. And in a way, and what I want you to pay attention to here is the very act of creating this poem is its own form of song. And it's a form of song that um, uses plain language, as Carol said, and does not, is not afraid with poking fun at herself and being honest about our condition as human beings. Um, so this song in, in its own way unburdens her from all of this other stuff. You know, we're here, she's asking all of those questions, interrogating, interrogating, interrogating. Um, you know, if you're like me, sometimes you get up in the morning and it's before you've even had your first cup of coffee, the, the list of questions and to-dos and concerns and worries are already stacking up. And I haven't even had a cup of coffee yet, for goodness sake. Um, and yet what we're able to do here early in the morning is maybe begin with praise. So just as a takeaway tonight, um, next time you get up and you start making that list of afflictions and concerns and anxieties, just get out there and sing. <laughs> All right, let's, let's uh, move to her love of the natural world, but you'll also see her through the lens of the natural world getting to the very essence of life itself. Um, volunteer, please, to read from Luke this, this verse. I'll read it for all the day. Thanks, Alvin. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. Luke 9. Jesus spoke a lot in paradoxes. Paradoxes are tough for us to wrap our minds around. That's why he used them so often. Because basically it's two things which there's no way that could be true somehow are true. And, and that's the beauty of a paradox and why they're so powerful in terms of a rhetorical device. And to me, this is the essence of following Jesus as disciples. Um, now, I think I'm going to need the rest of my life to explore the mystery and the meaning behind these words. I loved when Mary Oliver said, there's so many different names for that mystery, the way that she put that. Um, these words are very mysterious to me, but this much I know, they involve what in the New Testament we know of as kenosis, self-emptying, which is that we empty ourselves of self-obsession, of ego, um, of wanting to appear good and right before others and God, um, and emptying ourselves of, of all of that uh, need of projection and that false self um, so that we can be filled to overflowing with the life of Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus himself models that pattern of life. But it sure isn't easy. Um, I'll go ahead and read in Blackwater Woods. Look! The trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this. The fires and the black river of loss whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, we must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones knowing your own life depends on it, 
And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. That comes from her collection called American Primitive. It's, it's her book that won the Pulitzer Prize. And again, very straightforward words, right? I mean, we use these words all the time. But the way she combines them, the way that she breaks these lines, you know, that form and structure is important for us to pay attention to. Um, but I want to shush. I want to hear your take on this poem. And what, what are you, what's catching your eye? What's catching your ear in Blackwater Woods? Brother Dave, I'm, I'm, I'm immediately struck by the line in my lifetime leads back to this, the fires of the Black River of Loss whose other side is salvation. Just describing a black river of loss and the other side of that is salvation. Now, it's just really powerful. It is. You know, that's, it's that who wants to say, who, who, those who want to save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake will save it. Um, but loss is confusing and hurtful. I mean, I was riding my bike the other day by Blackwater Creek over in uh, off Moccasin Gap Road. And man, that water was murky. I looked down at it as I was driving by. And, you know, if we've ever been in in a wooded area where there's a river or stream that is, is murky and utterly, you know, impenetrable. It's scary. Uh, like when you go in the ocean and you can't see the bottom, it's, un, you know, unfathomable, we say. Uh, it's, it's, it's scary. Just like when we experience terrible grief and loss in life is really disorienting and scary. But she's making the claim here that on other side of, of that black river, is salvation. Wow. And, and she's saying on top of that, that none of us will ever know what salvation really means. Wow. I, this is Laurel here. I like the concrete reference in the end of the first, or the whole first stanza. The trees are turning their black bodies into light. And good grief, light. I mean, light, love, salvation, it's, it's right there. And yet, not so obvious in that first stanza where we're going. Right. I like the ending of it. I, I mean, I like the fact that she talks about loving, un, loving what is mortal by mortal, knowing that you're going to lose it. That is something that's going to eventually die. Loving it fiercely, um, and then the the amazing last last line into um, letting it go. And, yeah. and of course, that reflects the scripture as well in terms of life. But that's that's not what she means. I think exactly here. Um, I, I think she's talking about a person here. Thank you, Carol. I, I agree. And um, and she's also the poet's also acknowledging her own mortality against you know to hold it against your bones. That's a pretty stark reference right you know to, that's what's left over when we when we die we you know our bones um i hear resonances and maybe it's just you know because this is i'm just a church person but 
I'm hearing resonance here of Micah. You know, oh mortal, what is required of you? To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with God. You know, there are these three essentials in life. And, you know, these are, this is Mary's Micah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I love the simplicity of this. You know, to live in this world, we must be able to do three things. I mean, it's, it's a bold statement. So, Dave, is she, am I interpreting this correctly? Um, what I see in the poem is the, the movement of, of the seasons from, from the brilliance of fall into the cold of winter, just like life um, dealing with our own mortality, and that she's, she's giving us sort of a, she's kind of pointing out the path through the woods of our own path, that we're all heading on the same path. And that at the end, she gives us some instructions. But I love the fall, what I'm seeing as the fall symbolism leading into winter. That's another reason why I wanted to select this. Thanks for seeing that, Kenneth, of the turning of the seasons, that kind of elegiac turn from the last of summer, the trees turning their own bodies into pillars of light. Um, you know, and we've all seen the beautiful light recently, um, this fall. It's really been stunning. And it's gorgeous, but we know that we're getting less and less of it, that light. <laughs> As it gets darker earlier, you know, we all feel that. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. We move from a place of abundance, and all of a sudden we're in this pretty stark woodland. Father Dave, I have a question. Yes. It's not, I don't have any like real, you know, meaning like, you know, some of the other ones have expressed, but I looked at her, the structure of her poem and compared it to the last one that we looked at. And I noticed between each stanza, it's like she starts a thought at the end of a stanza and it goes to the next stanza. Um, I don't know. I just wondered what you thought about that and what, she was trying to do with that and or if it is, is even relevant but it just uh, it just kind of noticed it because it wasn't like her other poem it seemed like things ended in you know each one so, sally given the content of the poem especially if you can see my little arrow in this area in my lifetime leads back to this but given the content of this poem what might that white space between the stanzas and the breaking of these lines, how would that connect to that? Because um, I think you're onto something. What do you think? I didn't get a question to, to <laughs> I, mean, I didn't ask a question to get a question, but I don't know. I, I looked at it as a pause and I thought it was a purposeful pause with it and you know maybe when we go through life you know there are pauses in life but it, it's still a continuous process and I guess she's looking at it, it being a circular process in a way but um, I don't really know what do other folks think try not to miss too much more I got my commission. I think Father Dave going back to something that that Kenneth said about the seasons maybe maybe the space between the stanzas serves as the changing of seasons in our lives until we get to that point where we look back and say in my lifetime leads back to this. I love this. I, and I'm really grateful that you're paying attention to the, the form um, because you're onto something here. And, I wonder, I'm sorry, I think someone was gonna share. Well, I was just gonna say for me, um, like in the first part, she says, look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars. And then she'll go, like all of a sudden it's dawned on her of light, you know, and, and then she'll go, uh, it just seems to be that's the re repeat of it. She'll talk about something and then she, it's like she has an aha moment after that. That's the way I'm reading it anyway. Beautiful. Like over here, in my lifetime leads back to this. 
the fires and the black river of loss, whose other side, and there's a pause, is salvation. So that's the way I'm kind of reading it. It's kind of like giving herself some time to pause, to think, and to maybe name it or identify it a little more. Yeah, and you know, out of silence we speak. Out of death we live. Um, I, th I think it's, it gets back to that paradoxical nature of things that we, we spoke before. And, you know, interestingly enough, poetic shape, the, the form, has its roots going back to the Greeks. Um, and jamming and line breaks, etc., have to do with the plowing of land. Think of this as furrows in a field. And so Mary Oliver certainly would have been aware of that and that sense of the land itself being a text. Um, and so I think you're, it's really good that you've emphasized this. I, you know, I, I'm looking at that space and I think of this sense of loss that mm -hmm. she's talking about. You mm -hmm. know, and it's out of that loss that springs life, new life, new words, new experiences. But all lives will have these, ex these experiences of real loss, of silence, of struggling to hear God's voice, you know. Uh, that's what I make of it, but, you know, whatever it's worth. But Sally, thanks for drawing our attention to that. It's really important. Laurel? On that same train of thought, the very end then, the last space echoes the last line, let it go. Say more about that. I, I actually wanted to end up by talking about the ending of it. Why the repetition, Laura? Why the echo? Well, I'm not sure. Do you have an idea about that, Dave? <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Um, yet, I'd love to ask the group, do you have any thoughts about why she repeats those, that phrase? To something that you've loved that much. Um, uh, it, it, you don't let it go just once. I mean, it, it just becomes a, um, a, a series of letting it go. I mean, in a literal sense. And it's also for emphasis. So it's like when you're saying goodbye to a loved one at the airport, there's not going to be one hug. There'll be the hug at the car, and then the hug at the ticket counter, and then the hug at the gate. And then <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I love that. Yeah. Well, I think we... Um, It's, it's 702, so if any of you need to head out, don't, just know that um, you can just uh, leave the meeting, no problem. I, but I'll, I'll keep going for those who'd like to stay on for one more, um, even though we're at time here. So this is the gift, and I wanted to leave you with this one because it's just so beautiful, and I think we all need a little bit of a gift right now in this uncertain time. Um, a volunteer, please, to read from Psalm 62. I'll do it, Father Dave. Thanks, Tom. For God alone, my soul in silence waits. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall not be greatly shaken. Psalm 62. I'm wondering if someone could read her poem, The Gift. Good Father Day. The Gift. Be still, my soul, and steadfast. Earth and heaven both are still watching. Though time is draining from the clock and your walk 
that was confident and quick has become slow. So be slow if you must, but let the heart still play its true part. Love still as once you loved, deeply and without patience. Let God and the world know you are grateful that the gift has been given. One of the things that I'm learning in my program at Florida State is how even the masterful, extraordinary poets, people like Mary Oliver and Elizabeth Bishop, revise, 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 that, um, you know, our, our teachers will go to the archives of someone like Elizabeth Bishop, and they'll find, you know, the drafts of a poem like One Art, and remind us, apprentice poets, that even the masters take 20, 30 drafts before they get the final form of the work. And you heard Mary Oliver in that interview say, so much of poetry is simplicity, of just taking away everything that's non-essential. And this poem to me seems like, it seems so simple, right? Like, I could write this in the back of a napkin, you know? <laughs> Um, not really. I mean, it probably took her a month to create this and probably 20, 30 drafts of cutting, cutting what's non-essential. Because it seems to me what's left here is essential. <laughs> but I want to hear your take on this. Uh, what do you notice about the gift? I... Uh... I, I look at it as a, a quote unquote older adult mm -hmm. and say, you know, this, this is uh, for those of us that have way more yesterdays than tomorrow. This is the path we're on. And we do start to think more about earth and, and heaven, about kind of departing one and looking to the other. Uh, so I, I'm assuming she wrote this later in life. I, I just think it's a beautiful dis depiction of what we need to do as we age and get closer to the end. Thanks, Kathy. I assume she means here that the gift that has been given is, is her life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw it a little more deeply as salvation. I mean, as the promise, that's the gift. The gift is that we, Jesus, I mean, and that we have God, that we have a promise of eternity. And being slow now is just part of it. Not that I consider myself having moved towards aging, at least. Um, anxiety is not necessary. It's okay to slow down. It's okay to realize that we've had life and we have the promise of an afterlife. Thanks, Laurel. What do you make of, um, it's a quirky little part that I hadn't noticed when I read it earlier. Um, towards the, uh, the, the end of the poem, love still as you once, sorry, love still as you once you loved. What? Wait a minute. Love still as once you loved, <laughs> deeply and without patience. I love that, without patience. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's unexpected. Mm -hmm. I, I, I look at it as though even though time marches on, love is eternal. Mm -hmm. It's a gift from God and one that no matter how old we get, we should still let God and the world know that we are grateful for that capacity to love. Um, 
you know, uh, true love never dies. The body may go into the ground, but the love that person has for you or the love that you have for that person transcends death. Yeah, you know, one of the things that came to mind for me was a sense of childlike exuberance, mm -hmm. that even when we're older, we can still love mm -hmm. God and love others with abandon, with, without patience, actually, <laughs> with this eagerness. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Father Dave, Yes, um, I, I see it as a contrast um, in that clearly she's saying uh, her body has slowed down. Um, the walk that was quick has become slow. Uh, but on the other hand, so be slow if you must, you know, to what parts of us have to be have to be slower. But the heart doesn't have to slow down. The heart, mm -hmm. the love can be just as intense and just as true and just as deep as it was when we were very young or 20 or 30 and we weren't slow. So uh, I just think that's absolutely beautiful. And without patience, sometimes, you know, if you have, a, if you have something you wanna tell someone or some good news, you can't wait to do it. You, you, you say, I need to talk to you now. And, and I think that's, that impatience is the way she wants to continue to love. Um, and then um, I did think, you know, we all have our take, uh, that reading this, I would think, yes, I am grateful. I'm grateful for all the years that God mm -hmm. has given me and the gift that I have been given is my, is the uh, beauty and all that is given to be me as my life. Um, so mm -hmm. anyway, that's how I see it. So uh, Laurel. On the same note, her choice of words, we talk about revision, I, wonder why she settled on love still the word still as opposed to now or any other word and without patience yeah. and still and deep to me go together so mm -hmm. that trio still deep and without patience I don't have a problem with that. I think it's quite mm -hmm. powerful. No, I do too. It's wonderful. So in a poem, where there aren't that many words, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stills going on there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so here, you know, I hear still as both being fully present to the moment, but also uh, an endurance, you know, enduring. Um, mm -hmm. And yet that without patience to me is like, like a child sees a gift up in the attic that's for, wrapped for Christmas and cannot wait to open up that gift. <laughs> or how many times have you had a gift for someone and you literally could not wait to give it to them? It's that sense of urgency. But that... I, Go ahead, Joanne. You no, know, all, all I was going to say is I've been looking at that, and what I see is like a child with a new puppy, and it's like the, the puppy's loving the child, and the child's loving the puppy, and it's like total no patience, no justifying it, no, no thinking about it. It's just love, you know. It's just enjoyment. I don't know why, but I see a puppy and a little, a little child. <laughs> I love that. And how many pictures did we see with Mary and her dogs? <laughs> I forgot that, but yes, she had her dog there. Yeah. Yes, they were faithful. More than one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so. you know, the word still, I mean, she does in one word. <laughs> brings the past and the present together. 
you know, if that's, you know, if she talks about being simple with words and not being fancy with words. Yeah. And I think still is a way in one word of bringing what's happened in the past and what's happening now together. Perfect, Sally. I love that. Yeah. Well, this has been a really, really wonderful class. I hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've enjoyed exploring the, the poetry of Mary Oliver and seeing that well, I don't think we could call her conventionally religious, um, as you could tell from that interview. The truth is, she definitely was a churchgoer because there are many poems in Thirst where she's talking about receiving the Eucharist. So she, for sure, participated in worship in various points in her life. Um, but she's a deeply, deeply spiritual writer. And thank you for teaching me about uh, the poetry of Mary Oliver tonight. This has been a wonderful, wonderful class. I'd like to close with a prayer for church musicians and artists. Let us pray. O oh God, whom saints and angels delight to worship in heaven, be ever present with your servants who seek through art and music to perfect the praises offered by your people on earth and grant to them even now glimpses of your beauty and make them worthy at length to behold it unveiled forevermore. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Father well, Dave. So you are welcome. Much. Excellent. Bless you all. Have a wonderful week. God's peace be with you. Great to see you tonight, and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Father, Thanks, Father Dave. Dave. Good night. Good night. Good night. Mm -hmm.